Uh, Mr. Strain in his uh, Friday night Bible study, or actually his email, said to us, quote, the last six millennia are littered with war after war, uh, deaths uncounted and atrocities beyond the imagination of most people. The Sabbath is a special opportunity for us to pray for God's kingdom to come. And our mission, of course, is to preach the gospel to the world. So most of you know, we've heard of the announcements of the TW initiatives. We have the uh, TWPs every weekend in uh, February and March of uh, 2022. Uh, this weekend, we have Mr. Adam West in uh, Schenectady, New York, and uh, Dr. Jeff Fall in uh, Las Vegas. And then next week, we have Columbia, South Carolina on the Sabbath of March 12th, Augusta, Georgia, Sunday, March 13th, and then Mr. Rod McNair will be giving TWPs in Charleston, West Virginia, and Bristol, uh, Virginia next weekend. And then our first TWP, as you heard the announcement uh, for Charlotte, will be just uh, two weeks from tomorrow on Sunday, March uh, 20th. That's the first day of spring, by the way. And Mr. Weston will f give the follow-up TWP on Sunday, March 27th. And then the following Sabbath, April 1st, is the first day of the sacred year, Nisan 1, which means that the Passover will be uh, the evening of Thursday, April 14th, just six weeks away from last Thursday. Then the seven days of unleavened bread follow. Uh, my wife was shopping the other day, and she noticed one of the products she was purchasing had leaven in it. So she's already on the alert for the days of unleavened bread. Imagine what it was like in 31 AD in Jerusalem. Uh, Josephus mentions there were two million people uh, that came into Jerusalem to keep the Old Testament Passover. That's in the uh, Jewish uh, historical wars of the Jews, 693. In 39 AD, 31 AD, Jesus and the 12 apostles met for the Passover. You'll turn to Matthew, the 26th chapter. Matthew 26. We have a recording of that Passover. Matthew 26. And uh, in that Passover, Jesus instituted the new covenant for his disciples and for us. Matthew 26 and verse 27. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink from, all of, from it all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins. The King James Version has testament, a new King James Version has covenant, for this is the blood of the new covenant. And of course, the covenant is in Greek is the word theotheki, which is a contract or a covenant or a testament. So eating the bread and drinking the wine was a confirmation of the disciples' acceptance of Christ's shed blood and his coming sacrifice. Uh, they declared their commitment to God and to Christ. There was a difference between, of course, the covenant and a commitment. We do not renew the covenant because that was solidly made when we were baptized and we accepted, made that covenant with Christ, accepted that New Testament covenant. But we can renew our commitments. In Matthew 26, verse 30, we'll read, continuing on. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, all of you, will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have uh, been raised, I will go before you before Galilee. Now notice Peter's commitment. Peter answered and said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Uh, Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all of the disciples. So they were committed to uh, serve Christ. 
but they failed in that commitment. How can you avoid failing in your commitment? Well, we read on here when Jesus went to, to pray for himself, he came back and, and found them sleeping. And after he prayed, he said to them, verse 40, then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, what, could you not watch with me one hour? Verse 41, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So today, we, when we consider commitments for the Passover, how can we be sure that we will not fail in keeping those commitments? Jesus said, watch and pray. Uh, could you not be with me for one hour, he was saying. What is a commitment? Webster's Dictionary, to pledge or assign to some particular course or use. We pledge to be, have a faithful relationship with God. A covenant, on the other hand, is a binding agreement, a compact. And by our baptism, we demonstrate our acceptance of the new covenant and the new covenant terms. And of course, by our repentance and our faith in Christ's sacrifice. So Hebrews, the eighth chapter, we'll turn, turn there. Hebrews, the eighth chapter. We need to make sure that we fulfill our commitments. Hebrews, the eighth chapter. What commitments will you make for the Passover? Hebrews 8 and verse 7. We find that the Old Covenant was a binding agreement with the Israelites, but did they keep their part of the covenant? Hebrews 8 and uh, verse 7. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second, because finding fault with them, not again the covenant, the fault was with them, he says, <clears throat> Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. That's yet to come when Christ comes back and fulfills the 70th week, the last part of the 70th week of his ministry, as we read, in, of course, in Daniel, the ninth chapter. Nor according to the covenant that I made with their fathers <clears throat> that day when I took them by the hand uh, to lead them, out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. So they were not faithful, and we need to make sure that we are faithful in keeping the covenant and, again, making our commitments for the Passover. If you want more information on the New Covenant, uh, Dr. Meredith's article on the uh, Tomorrow's World magazine, November, December 2005, uh, New Covenant, question mark. A very a good comprehensive description of the new covenant. So at the Passover, we remember the sacrifice of Christ, his shed blood for the remission of sins, his broken body for our healing. Remember their binding agreement that we made at baptism. And we observe the annual memorial of Christ's sacrifice for his by his beaten body and his shed blood. So in 31 AD, the disciples were told to prepare the Passover, Matthew 26, uh, verse 17. They asked Jesus, <clears throat> where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? So they had to prepare physically, as we will do, preparing physically, but we must also uh, prepare spiritually, and over the next few weeks, you'll be hearing some sermons on Passover preparation and how to examine yourself for the Passover. And we will also be making some commitments, which we'll discuss in the sermon today, and uh, realizing that children uh, will not be taking the Passover, and some teenagers will not be taking the Passover, you still can make commitments. Because some of these commitments are not just commitments for a Passover, but are commitments for a life. And you consider those as we discuss each of these 10 commitments. And the title of the sermon today is 10 
Passover commitments. Ten Passover commitments. <clears throat> Number one, be committed to maintain a repentant attitude. Be committed to maintain a repentant attitude. This is probably the longest point of the ten points in today's sermon. <clears throat> I remember a, a, a sermon by Dr. Charles Dorothy. Dr. Dorothy was the head of the Spanish work of the Spanish you know, department in Pasadena years ago and then in Big Sandy later on. And I believe it was the Feast of Tabernacles around 1964 in Big Sandy. We had 8,000 people in the audience. And I believe Dr. Dorothy gave what would have been the shortest sermon in the history of God's church. He got up before the 8,000 people on this large, large stage and actually was, had a chair for the speakers. They were on the stage even before they got up to speak. And he got up to speak and he said something, Brethren, I've got just one word for you today. And he yelled out, Repent! And then he sat down in the chair and finished his sermon. <laughs> well, well, he get, did go up later and gave a full sermon, but uh, he did make a point, and it was a very memorable sermon, the shortest sermon you ever heard, to repent, and uh, it did make an impression on all of us. So when we examine ourselves, we look at the sp spiritual strengths, we look at the spiritual weaknesses, we want to know about our attitude and our thinking, and as we heard in the sermonette, how but Job didn't really know himself until God revealed him to himself as human nature. We have to learn from our mistakes. I won't turn there, but King David said in Psalm 69 and verse 5, O oh God, you know my foolishness, and my sins are not hidden from you. You might turn to uh, Psalm 19. Psalm 19, you know, God knows all our thoughts. When we examine ourselves, we know that God already knows more about us than perhaps we know ourselves. Psalm 19, and we'll start off in verse 11. Psalm 19. We'll start in verse 12. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me, that I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. So we need to remember that God knows our faults, and we need to consider that he knows those faults. He says, David said, keep me from presumptuous sins. I, I can think back in my life when I've made some uh, presumptuous errors, uh, kind of embarrassing at the moment. But we need to repent of all those things we can find as we examine ourselves and realize that, yes, uh, there are some things that we find in ourselves that are kind of hidden, and the examination process discloses some of those hidden corners. I think some of you know the story of the dishonest painter. He was a painter in competition to paint church buildings. And he got the lowest bid. But the reason he got the lowest bid, he would thin out the paint, water down the paint. So he painted one building with the thinned down paint. And it rained and all the paint just dissipated. And he prayed, he said, Lord, what shall I do? And a voice came from heaven, said, repaint, repaint and thin no more. Anyway, we need to make sure that we repaint, repaint and thin no more. We need to pay for the damage we do and need to restore what is taken. I won't turn there, but you know the story of Zacchaeus in Luke, the 19th chapter. Uh, Zacchaeus was a prosperous uh, taker and says in Luke 19, verse 8, Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, 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 
I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. I remember one time in examining myself, I, re I found out that I had a book that I had borrowed and had not returned. And that self-examination helped me to realize, oh, I had that book for two years. It belongs to someone else. So finally, I returned that book. That's a part of the process of repentance. We need to examine our attitude towards repentance. And of course, that's revealed where? Second Corinthians, the seventh chapter, talks about godly sorrow. Turn to Second Corinthians, uh, the seventh chapter. Second Corinthians seven. He's talking about the sinner that he excoriated, and of course there was this fellow in the first Corinthians epistle, and now in the second Corinthians epistles, he's telling them to accept the repentant sinner back into the congregation. And he says in verse 10, 2 Corinthians 7, for godly sorrow, <clears throat> for godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. <clears throat> but the sorrow of the world works death. And so you have criminals saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Well, they're sorry that they got caught, and they got sorry that they're in prison, but they're not sorry for what they had done. That's the sorrow of the world that produces death. Verse 11, for observe this same very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner, what diligence it produced in you. So there was a change in behavior and attitude of the Corinthian congregation. What clearing of yourselves, what indignation. You're indignant at evil. What fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In all things, you proved yourself to be clear in this matter. And so we need to examine ourselves and see do we bear the fruits of godly sorrow? And make sure that we examine ourselves. We have an article in the March, April 2009 LCN, Self-Examination, a Vital Key to Growth. I'll just quote from that. Examine your attitude toward repentance. Have you repented of your sins? Do you right now have a repentant attitude? Have you made a commitment to maintain a repentant attitude to the end of your life? Uh, Paul described the difference between worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. And have you seen fruits of godly sorrow in your own life? And have you had that tall indignance, uh, indignation uh, towards evil? Because we know in Proverbs 8, 13, it says, the, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy, and the evil way do I, I hate. So we need to confess our sins and ask God for the fruits of godly sorrow. And what do we repent of? Of course, sin, 1 John 3, 4, for sin is the transgression of law, the King James Version. And we know that we have repent of human nature, and what is your nature? Romans 8, 7, the carnal mind is enmity against God, is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, or it's hostile to God. Now we hope we no longer have that aspect of carnality in our mind. We know that we do have, we are human and we have human nature, but we have repented of the hostility that we had towards God. And that's what the Apostle Paul talks about in Romans 7, about his human nature and that's something that the biblical scholars can't understand, that, that Paul uh, really realized that he had human nature and was still battling it. So we all have blind spots in our life, and sometimes we can't see, as, as we indicated in the sermon, we can't see certain aspects of our own nature and, and the nature of others. There's a poem by Robert Burns, a Scottish 18th century Scottish poet, and he wrote a poem called, To a Louse. He was looking at a tiny creature wandering through the hair of a lady seated in front of him, called a louse. The eighth stanza of the poem 
contains a well-known phrase in Scottish, Award some power the gift of years to see ourselves as others see us. Or in modern English, Oh, would that some power give us the gift to see ourselves as others see us. Uh, sometimes we don't want to do that. The uh, first time a uh, spokesman gets, get to see themselves on a videotape, you realize, oh, I didn't know I was doing that. I know sometimes when I look at a sermon, I'm, I'm fiddling with my ring or something, you realize, oh, I didn't know I, I was doing that. So do you have the character flaws that others can see, but you don't see in your own life? And so annually, once a year, I have the courage to ask my wife, I go, honey, in preparation of the Passover, what one thing do you think I need to be changing in my life? And she'll start off one, two, three, four. And I said, only one, one thing that you see I could change in my life. So <clears throat> that's always very hopeful. It takes courage to do. And we all have uh, spiritual blind spots. A physical blind spot is, according to Merriam-Webster Dictionary, the small circular area at the back of the retina where the optic nerve enters the eyeball and which is devoid of rods and cones and is not sensitive to light. You can do an experiment. You take a piece of paper and line up your eyes and put one uh, dot right in line with each eye. Then you cover one eye and if the left eye or the other eye is lined up with that dot, the dot will disappear. You have a blind spot a physical blind spot in your eye. But there is also the definition of blind spot from Miriam Webster, an area in which one fails to exercise judgment or discrimination. And so we all may have our blind spots and the preparation for the Passover make sure that perhaps we can find that. And of course, in driving in our automobiles, we have a blind spot on the the right rear or left rear of our car we have to be very careful of, but we have spiritual blind spots that we need to understand and make sure that we are repenting of those weaknesses in our, in our lives. The Greek word for repentance is metanoia, which means a change of mind, a turning around. In other words, a change of thinking. And remember when the Pharisees came to John's baptism in Matthew 3 and verse 7, he said, who has warned you to free, I said, brood of vipers? Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bring forth fruits fitting for repentance. And so when we're counseling people for baptism, we need to see, yes, are there fruits fitting repentance? We turn to Psalm 51, of course, one that we read during the Passover service itself, <clears throat> but one that is some we should remind ourselves <clears throat> and pray every once in a while during the year. Psalm 51, verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me against you only. You only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. David had sinned by committing adultery. He had sinned by having Uriah killed. But why was he sinning against God? Because God said the law, you shall not murder and you shall not commit adultery. So we sin against God, and we sin against our brothers and sisters. But he said, against you only have I done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. And then, of course, verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, <clears throat> and uphold me by your generous spirit. So when we maintain a repentant attitude, we'll acknowledge our weaknesses and our sins. We'll realize that we don't practice sin, that we make mistakes, need to learn from our mistakes. We sin from time to time and learn 
from lessons from those sins and to realize, yes, we are dedicated to always be in a repentant attitude. And that <clears throat> that's why he said in Romans 8, there is no therefore condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Why not? Because when sin is brought to your mind, you immediately repent of it and God extends grace and forgiveness. And so we need to make sure that we are dedicated and committed for life to maintain a repentant attitude, number one. Number two, be committed to accept God's forgiveness. Do you ever feel guilty? Uh, sometimes people try to make you feel guilty and give you a, a guilt trip. And abused victims sometimes are made to feel guilty for the crime committed by the abuser. 1 John 1 and verse 9, you, you know that, but uh, turn there. 1 John 1 and verse 9. A wonderful promise from God. 1 John 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And of course, verse 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So we need to make sure that if we have repented, God will forgive us from all our sins, and that we bring forth the fruits of godly sorrow, and the, the fruits of repentance. We look at ourselves and realize, yes, we have strengths, we have weaknesses, we need to learn from our lessons. And what brings repentance about? This is a wonderful verse. Turn to Romans, the second chapter. A wonderful revelation and one that I, I hope you've seen active in your life. Romans 2 and verse 4. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering? not knowing the goodness of God leads you to repentance. <clears throat> and you realize, when you look back on your life, when you sinned, God could have judged me right then and ha had me killed because I, at that point in time, had a sin that was committed that would bring upon me the death penalty. But God is merciful, he's patient, long-suffering. You know, it came to the time when the Amorites, God said the iniquity of the Amorites was not quite full uh, before he made judgment upon them. So God, by his forbearance and goodness, brings us and leads us to re repentance. But thank God that he gives us that repentance and forgiveness. So number two, be committed to accept God's forgiveness. And realize when you read, of course, as I've mentioned before several times, when you read the book of Revelation, and you realize the word lamb appears 26 times referring to Christ's sacrifice. So his sacrifice will be always remembered. Remember, the, he is the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So number two, be committed to always accept God's forgiveness. And of course, that's always predica predicated upon your repentance. Number three, be committed to forgive others. The Lord's Prayer, and we'll have the uh, special music uh, coming up, the virtual choir on the Lord's Prayer. Uh, but remember uh, what Jesus said in verse 12, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So we need to make sure that we are forgiving others. Right, turn to Ephesians, the fourth chapter, Ephesians 4. Again, we have <clears throat> Ephesians, the fourth chapter, and Colossians, the third chapter, the old man and the new man. You make sure the old man stays dead and the new man is renewed in life. Ephesians, the fourth chapter, and we'll start here. <clears throat> There's so many wonderful verses in here. Verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. But uh, <clears throat> chapter 4, starting with uh, verse 30. 
and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, <clears throat> and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And I know that there are some individuals who have uh, uh, just can't let go. They've been offended, and they still have difficulty forgiving the offender. There is a book written by uh, Dr. Paul Meyer in his book, Don't Let Jerks Get the Best of You. He talks about people having depression and that they could be overcome that depression through forgiving the abuser. Quote, a patient can be depressed for many years, then forgive the one who caused the repressed anger and totally recover from the depression because the serotonin has been restored naturally and the brain is able to work correctly. That's from uh, page 170, uh, don't let the jerks get the best of you. On page 152, he states that deep-seated anger can lower your serotonin level and cause clinical depression, but forgiving others can produce peace of mind. And I know of some who've had very difficulty on letting go. And of course, there's that, that uh, famous statement, let go and let God uh, take care of it. Matthew 6 and verse 14, Matthew 6, verse 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. <clears throat> Number three. Be committed to forgive others. <clears throat> Number four, be committed to avoid spiritual weaknesses. There are two causes for committing the unpossible pardonable sin. One is through spiritual weakness, and the other is through bitterness. Number four, be committed to avoid spiritual weakness. Now turn to Hebrews, the second chapter. Hebrews, the second chapter. <clears throat> Hebrews 2 and verse 1. Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression or disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? You cannot neglect the great salvation that God has promised. And that will happen if you give in to spiritual weaknesses. You don't want to neglect God's gift. You want to make sure, even though he calls not many mighty, not many noble, he still gives us spiritual power that he doesn't give the mighty and the noble in this world. And so we have the warning in <clears throat> Hebrews, the sixth chapter, Hebrews 6. Verse God gives us the power to overcome. In Acts 1, verse 8, he said, Jesus said, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And we know that's the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. But Hebrews 6 and verse 4. Hebrews 6 and verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have made become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves again the Son of God and put him to an open shame. So we made that commitment of baptism. We said, no, we are going to be faithful. Uh, we will not fall away. We realize that we are on a path to eternal life and God's grace and forgiveness as long as we strive to live by his every word. So make sure that you are committed to avoid spiritual weakness. We have the article in the uh, Tomorrow's World magazine, 
uh, January, February 2010, have you committed the unpardonable sin? So if you have any questions, you can check on that article. Have you committed the unpardonable sin? Tomorrow's World Magazine, January, February uh, 2010. And, and of course, most of those people calling in said, well, have I committed the unpardonable sin? Well, no, the, the very fact that they're concerned about it, they have not committed the unpardonable sin, obviously. <clears throat> but t trials tend to weaken us spiritually unless we close God and realize as we face those trials, as it says in James 1 and verse 2, my brethren count it all joy when you fall into various trials. And we're falling into various trials and have these past two years and even years before, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. <clears throat> but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect or mature, lacking nothing. You may be complete. And God promises to intervene for us personally, as some of you have already heard in the prayers of the saints and the brethren for one another as we hear the prayer requests every week and pray for one another. And, and God intervenes because our prayers come up before God's throne as incense, as it in, says, uh, incense, as it says in uh, Revelation. So we thank God, but he tells us in Hebrews 4, 16, come boldly before the throne of grace, that you may obtain grace and mercy and help in time of need, and help in time of need. And I think it's always a time of need for me, always wanting God's grace and his mercy. So number three, uh, be, of, com, uh, be committed, number four, be committed to avoid spiritual weakness. And along that same line, the other side of the coin Avoid spiritual bitterness. We already read that in Ephesians, the fourth chapter. And let's uh, have another warning in Hebrews, the twelfth chapter, about bitterness. <clears throat> How do you avoid bitterness? We, we, we get offended. Uh, people offend us. And how do we, again, how do we handle those offenses? Hebrews, twelfth chapter. Hebrews 12, starting with uh, verse 11. <clears throat> now the chastening seems to be joyful, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, <clears throat> but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may be not dislocated, but rather be healed. And I know many, many years ago when I was strongly corrected, I kind of, oh, I'm just going to, all right, I'm just going to fade into the wallpaper. I'm just not going to, I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to be low key. <laughs> well, God says you need to take that correction and go forward, uh, not just fade away. And uh, let it be healed. So <clears throat> he goes on here to say, Verse 13, make strength paths for your heel. Verse 14, pursue peace with all people and holiness without you. No one shall see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest any fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up while um, cause trouble, and by this become defiled. Now, any root of bitterness springing up, how do, you, how do you handle that? He says, follow peace with all men. And, of course, Jesus told us in Matthew 5, verses 44 through 48, uh, pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. Do good to them. So you apply unconditional love. If you have a, a root of bitterness... I think it was in Big Sandy one time, I think he told that story for, I don't know, it was a, uh, uh, some kind of a, a garlic root or something, but uh, someone had a plant in Big Sandy and it kept, kept digging it up, but it had another root, it kept digging it up, and he ended up this huge, huge pit because the root kept generating the plant time and time again. And you got to dig out that root of bitterness and make sure you spot it and make sure you get rid of it deeply. And so, of course, you pray for your enemies, as Jesus said, 
and you follow peace with all men. And of course, at the same time, you hate evil. You don't hate the sinner, but you hate the sin. In Proverbs 8, 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy in the evil way do I hope. Uh, do I, uh, uh, pride and uh, evil way and the persecuted do I hate. Then Romans 12, 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. And of course, there are many examples of that, and I won't need to go through some uh, right now, but Ezekiel 9, 4. Uh, where God said, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry for the abominations that are done in it. So again, we meditate on God's law, and we make sure that we get angry at sin, not at the sinner, and make sure that we are praying for our enemies, doing good to our enemies, judging ourselves, and maintaining a repentant attitude. So number five, be committed to avoid bitterness. Number six, <clears throat> be committed to overcome. And of course, that's worth several sermons. We'll be hearing that during the days of unleavened bread. Revelation two and Revelation three, seven times. Christ says, he that overcomes, and then the various rewards for overcoming. And Revelation 21, seven, he that overcomes shall inherit all things and I shall be as God, and he shall be my people, they shall be my people. But we have to overcome the lessons of the days of unleavened bread. And we overcome sin, self, Satan, and society, and make sure that we're overcoming human nature. I have a couple quotes on human nature. One is by Albert Einstein. <clears throat> Two things are infinite, the universe and human stupidity, and I'm not sure about the universe. Then Mark Twain <clears throat> said, there's a great deal of human nature in people. <laughs> Are you able to recognize that? So be committed to resist sin, never compromise, be willing to overcome. And it tells us in Hebrews 12 and verse four, you have not yet resisted a bloodshed, resisting against sin, striving against sin. So number six, be committed to overcome. Number seven, be committed to endure to the end. It tells us in Matthew 24, verse 13, he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. And we have sermons on the principles of uh, persevering. And we'll turn to Hebrews, the 12th chapter, and, and verse one. One of our scriptures we may quote here more frequently, but it's so powerful and so funda fundamental and foundational. Hebrews 12 <clears throat> and verse one. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, mentioned throughout Hebrews the 11th chapter, the faith chapter, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily ensnare us, and let us run with endurance, or other translations, perseverance. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. How? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand on the throne of God. So he was able to endure because he had the vision of the big picture and make sure that we are running the race with endurance and finishing the race. Second Timothy uh, four and verse six. Second Timothy four and verse six. This is the Apostle Paul's last letter. And he had gone through, as you know, all the various uh, trials and day and night in the, the deep and being beaten several times left for dead, 2 Timothy 4, 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is, hand, is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me at that day. 
and not only to me also, but to all who love his appearing. So we remember those who have died in the faith, and of course Mr. Garrett here recently, and remember that they are sleeping in Jesus, and that we will join them in the resurrection. And March 12th coming up is the 17th anniversary of the martyrdom in Milwaukee, and we honor those who by faith and example have died in the faith. Hebrews 11:13. these all died in faith, not having received the promise. It's what they looking for them, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So God has called us to endure to the end. Mr. Party and DBR Party and our, our beloved uh, evangelist here in Charlotte for so many years was coming to the office every day, even when he was age 94. And uh, he wrote an article in the Good News magazine, April, May 1966, The Point of No Return. And I think it's worth reading an excerpt from that article. A few months ago, a Boeing 707 jet on its way to San Francisco developed serious engine trouble over the Pacific. In the minds of many, it was very doubtful that the plane could pursue its journey safely without having to return to Hawaii, where the flight had begun. Even some of the members of the crew expected the captain to turn the plane back, but it couldn't be done. We have already passed the point of no return, the captain said with finality. We can't go back. The title of the article is The Point of No Return. The subhead, a law. Mr. Partian writes, here we find a firmly established law in flying that no captain dares to defy. It's an extremely logical one. Once the distance ahead is shorter than that already traveled, a plane can no longer go back, go back to its starting point. However, the mechanical difficulties may be. Literally speaking, it is supposed to have several severed its ties with the point of embarkation. The Boeing jet had just passed the point of no return. Therefore, it had to pursue its journey wherever, whatever the cost. He concludes the article by saying, there is a great lesson here that we in God's church can learn. There's a striking similarity between the plane's journey and the course we ourselves have taken in Christian life. If we are deeply converted, we too should have passed the point of no return. We too should have severed all ties with our point of embarkation, the world. Have you? A very effective article by Mr. Partian, The Point of No Return. Number seven, be committed to endure to the end. Number eight, <clears throat> Trust Christ to save you. Ephesians 2.8 is a memorization verse. I think many of you may know that. For by grace you have been saved by faith, through faith, and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before that we should walk in them. So God has promised to save us. And he saved us through grace and through faith. And we know that it's through the faith of Christ that we are saved. It tells us in Hebrews 7, verse 25, Therefore he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, seeing he always makes intercession for them. So he is able to save us to the innermost. It tells us in Hebrews 7, 25, we have a sermon uh, titled, Our Loving, Living Savior. So we've surrendered our lives to Christ, and we belong to him. It was my, my first year in pastor, pastoring uh, Cincinnati and Lexington years ago in 1965. And that atonement in 1965, we had a lady in Cincinnati who was dying <clears throat> And uh, 
I think we had at least 35 church members that helped uh, serve her and her husband. She was kind of a dominating wife. And it was kind of like, uh, you know, hubby, you belong to me. And I felt I needed to talk to her before she died. And she didn't have any tears. And I needed to tell her she needed to have some sense of, of sorrow and, and uh, in her pain. And the ladies later on said that, that they saw tears in her eyes and that just before she died, she called her husband over to him, the one that she would have been domineering, um, and had him raise her up to a sitting position in the bed. And she looked in his face and said, I belong to you. And that's been very memorable in my life. It's somewhat emotional. And I think about the Song of Solomon and the Shulamite woman who was pledging her life to the unseen shepherd, symbolically uh, Jesus Christ. And in the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 16, the Shulamite says, My beloved is mine, and I am his. But then later... The sequence is reversed. Solomon 6, verse 3. I am my beloved's, and he is mine. I hope that all of you have told God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ that you belong to them. It tells us in 1 Corinthians 6, and verse 19. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you? which you have of God, and you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which is God, 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19. So we ask God to save us, and uh, King David did, and you can read Psalm 6 and Psalm 7. We already sang uh, Psalm 6 today. Uh, there's another version of Psalm 6 in our hymnal, Save me, O God, by thy right hand, and judge me by thy strength, or uh, deliver me by my strength. So we can ask God to save us. I don't know how many times you have. I have asked God to save me. When you're in trouble and you're pain and suffering and going through trials, you can cry out to God to save you. And of course, in Romans 5 and verse 10, he says, for if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So Christ is our loving, living Savior, and you can ask him to save you. So trust Christ to save you. And of course it tells us in 1 Peter 5 and verse 7, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. That's First Peter 5, verse 8. So number eight commitment, trust Christ to save you. Number nine, be committed to thank God continually. How many times a day do you thank God or thank others? Uh, just at mealtime, if you're asking a blessing, We've heard in our sermons and in the telecast more recently, uh, several times, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 1. But know that this in the last time, perilous times will come. And all this listing of perverse behavior, of, of anti-God, anti-Bible behavior, one of them is unthankful, unholy. And so he tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 16, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. We had an article in the Living Church News, November, December 2021, in everything give thanks. Now turn to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 15. And uh, this is looking forward to the resurrection we're looking for the greatest victory that will come in the future. Those promises that we have embraced. 1 Corinthians 15 
and verse 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So be committed to thank God continually. Number 10, be committed to support God's work, which I know all of you are and have been, and we just thank, thank God for you as Mr. Weston was thanking you all in the world ahead. They wrote uh, February 17th. He said, uh, this weekend, Mr. Jonathan McNair is scheduled to give Tomorrow's World presentations in Montgomery and Birmingham, Alabama. The current Tomorrow's World subscription list now stands at 559,000. And so far this year, in less than two months, we have over 20,000 people requesting lesson one of the Bible study course. We also are ramping up Facebook ads in Israel, Europe, and Canada. It's encouraging to see and hear, our, 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 and hear of our members remaining strongly focused on doing the work of God, God has called us to do. Let us all keep that focus and put our hearts into our prayers for our efforts to produce fruit, <clears throat> for new doors to open, and for the faith and ability to walk through these doors. So it's, as he said, it's encouraging to see and here of our members remaining strongly focused on doing the work of God, the work of God has called us to do. And of course, we are praying as I've exhorted you and others have in Matthew 9, verse 37, that when he said, the harvest truly is plenty, plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers in his harvest. So I hope you're doing that. And But it's good to know that you have your heart in God's work, and that we approach the Passover, we realize that is the calling that God has given us, to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. How? By doing the work of God, to be committed to support God's work. So God has a plan of salvation for every boy and girl and every man and woman and every sinner. And the Passover is the first step in God's awesome plan and purpose for all of us to make us his glorified immortal children. He wants all of us to be a part of his royal family. So as we prepare for the Passover, I will encourage you to read the March-April Living Church News. Uh, I guess we have it. Has it come to the office yet? So we'll hope we'll be mailed out and We'll all get the March-April Living Church news here next week or the following week. Uh, but I encourage you to read these articles in preparation for the Passover. In the the March-April Living Church news 2022 is an article, Strive to Conquer Sin Completely, on page 6. Why is the Passover just for baptized members? Page 10. Complaining or completion? Page 12. Hezekiah's Humility, page 14. Uh, so be sure to read the Living Church News when it arrives in your home, hopefully next week, for the March-April uh, 2022 uh, Living Church News. So God loves every one of the eight billion people on the face of the earth. And the Passover guarantees that demonstration of that love. So brethren, let's prepare for the Passover by making these commitments. Number one, be committed to maintain a repentant attitude. Number two, be committed to accept God's forgiveness. Number three, be committed to forgive others. Number four, be committed to avoid spiritual weakness. Number five, be committed to avoid bitterness. Number six, be committed to overcome. Number seven, be committed to endure to the end. Number eight, be committed to trust Christ to save you. Number nine, be committed to thank God continually. Number 10, be committed to support God's work. So as we prepare for the Passover, let's be thankful and joyful for the gift of grace and forgiveness that God gives us. We thank God for the victory that he's given us over sin. 
and thank God for his calling to do to the work and to complete the Great Commission. So let's be deeply committed. Let's take the Passover willingly, gratefully, in faith, and with deep thanksgiving and gratitude. Remember to renew your commitments and to tell your Father in heaven and your Savior, I belong to you.